Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I'd like to begin today by showing an image. It's an image I'm sure you're familiar with before, but we can see by this image that though we might see the same picture, we don't always see the same thing. Looking at this picture, some of you will see an old hag, and while others of you will see a pretty lady. Even if you've seen it before, you tend to focus on one of those images naturally right away. What do you see? The story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is another one of those occasions when people view the same event but see different things. For many of the people, they saw the entrance of a prophet. For the religious leaders, they saw an approaching threat. We just heard that in our gospel lesson. Look, the world has gone after him. He was a threat. When Paul reflects on Jesus' life, and in particular this event in Philippians chapter two, he he saw a man who was being humbly obedient. Humbly obedient to his call. Today we're gonna look at four unique pictures uh, that this event conveys for us and what Christ teaches us about them. First of all, the triumphal entrance itself. It's difficult to capture the celebration and the irony that is contained in this one scene. You see, Jesus enters into Jerusalem triumphantly, yet he is seated on a donkey. Jesus enters into Jerusalem triumphantly, yet seated on a donkey. The motley group of his disciples surrounds him. People along the road cheer him on, and they say that he is the Messiah. Their hope for the return of the golden age of Israel The entire image, the entire parade conveys a different kind of power than that of earthly power, than that of earthly authority. You see, Romans who were victorious in battle and victorious in subduing people entered the city in a similar manner, but there were differences. Roman victors would enter astride a white steed. They would enter in visible power and authority. They were surrounded by legions of soldiers, not by a ragtag group of disciples. When Roman victors entered a city, the people were forced to welcome them, forced to sing their praises, but they, not, they were never called the Messiah. Jesus alone was called the Messiah, and the people were not forced to welcome Jesus into the city. They did so willingly. Second, we see Christ's humble obedience. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, reflected on the life of Christ. And those reflections cast a different light on this triumphal, triumphant entry into Jerusalem. First, he says, though Jesus was God, he did not count equality with God a thing to grasp. What do we call that? What do we call that when somebody is grasping to be equal with God? It's the oldest sin in the book. 
We call that pride. Jesus entered in Jerusalem, not prideful, but humble. Pride is the poison that stops people from glorifying God and causes people to glorify themselves. But Jesus didn't count equality with God, though he had every right to. Instead, Jesus became a man. He became a human being, one of us. While I doubt that he wore a cheese head hat in the New Testament, if he came today and he was from Wisconsin, I bet you he would. Because Jesus became one of us. He loved the people he came to be with and he was one of them. Fully human. Fully God. And in his humanity, Jesus didn't have the poison of pride in himself. Instead, he lowered himself. Lowered himself to be human. He who was God became man. and experienced all the limitations, all the temptations, all the pain, all the suffering, all the joys, all the frustrations that comes with being human. And as a man, Jesus was obedient. He was obedient to his Father in heaven. He was obedient to his parents on earth. He was obedient to the authorities of the day. He healed the sick, cast out demons, stilled the storms, fed the hungry. Even this entry into Jerusalem itself was an act of obedience. For Jesus knew that this is what he came to do. Everything he had done up to this point was for this purpose, to ride into Jerusalem, to go to the cross, to take the sins of the world on his shoulder. And he became obedient, even to the point of death even to death on the cross. Jesus died a criminal's death, though he had done no wrong. And he did so willingly because he was obedient. He was obedient because he loved us. As we see the triumphal entry, we see God's love. You see, Roman generals and politicians were motivated by pride and power when they entered into a city. They came in on a white steed because they were focused on themselves. On their pride, on their power, on their authority. But Jesus entered quite differently. Jesus entered Jerusalem in love. He entered in love because he was focused on God. He was focused on God, not himself. Focused on God and the people whom he came to save. Jesus entered in love. For Jesus indeed is the incarnation of God's love. 
the embodiment of who God is. For God so loved the world that he gave. And here he is, riding into Jerusalem. Because he loves God, he loves you, and he loves me. Jesus loved the people. Jesus loves people. And we see that as he rode into Jerusalem. Jesus loved those people even though he knew he was going to die by their hands. But he continued to love them. He wasn't forced to take this path. He wasn't forced into Jerusalem. No, Jesus chose this path willingly. Jesus' life was not taken by someone else. Jesus offered his life as a ransom for you and for me. And he did that willingly, of his own accord. And so the last image we see in the triumphal entry is humility. What is it that holds you back? What is it that holds you back from passionately honoring God and serving others? Could it be a lack of humility? Do you have any pride floating through your veins? Have you ever said, that's below me, when a chance to serve God or others has come your way? Dear friends, pride affects how we live. Pride affects how we live. The decisions you make, everything. There's a story told about Muhammad Ali, perhaps you remember him, he's a good boxer. The airplane, and he was on an airplane. The airplane started to experience some turbulence and the captain came on, on the, you know, over the loudspeaker and said, please fasten your seatbelt. Everyone did except for Muhammad Ali and so the stewardess came over and said, sir, would you please put your seatbelt on? To which Ali responded, Superman don't need no seatbelt. The stewardess, without missing a beat, said, yes, sir, but Superman don't need no airplane. Please buckle up. (laughs) Pride affects the way we live our lives. You and I are not Superman. You and I are not God. Pride affects the way we think and the words that you say. Is the poison of pride holding you back from glorifying God with all you've got? Is the poison of pride keeping you from serving others as Jesus has served you? Could this be the only thing that you need to change? Today, as we begin Holy Week, we go to the cross. We go to the cross and we see Jesus. We see Jesus and what is he covered with? Is it just blood and dirt? No. Jesus is covered with our sin, with 
our pride. Who will die for the sins of the world? I will, says Jesus. Who will take the blame for all the pride and adultery and violence and gossip and disrespect of this world? I will, says Jesus. Who will feel hell in the place of the human race? Who will die the worst death ever known to man? I will, says Jesus. Do you see what Jesus does for you at the cross? Jesus was and will always be the humblest man ever to walk the face of this earth. He gives away his wealth. He gives away his comfort. He gives away his status as God. And he gives it all away for you. And we see this part on Palm Sunday. But we see it ultimately on the cross. For a Christian, the cross is the ugliest place in the world. And yet it's the most beautiful. It's the most violent place in the world, and yet it's the most peaceful. At the cross, it's the most hellish place in the world, and yet it's also the most heavenly. It's the cross of Christ Jesus. That's where we go today. For it's at the cross that Jesus takes away our pride and he forgives us, he changes us and puts inside of us a divine kind of humility that only God can give. There at the cross, our sins are forgiven by the greatest love that has ever been given. This is what changes you. This is what changes me. And it makes us into someone who is humble, as Jesus was. May God bless you with genuine Christian humility that seeks to honor God with your whole life. May God bless you with genuine Christian humility that seeks to serve others with the same attitude with which Jesus served you. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.